Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm Pastor Jerry Milner, and I'm glad you're here. We're going to begin with Come Into His Presence. Would you rise to your feet and join us in singing? Say glory. 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 Oh, say it like you mean it. Glory. <laughs> glory. All right. Uh, you might as well remain standing unless you just want to do calisthenics. That's up to you. Uh, <laughs> but again, I'm Pastor Jerry Milner. Privilege to be the spiritual coach here for your first time visitor. Excuse me. That's too big. <laughs> make sure you get a coffee mug. We want to make sure that we uh, uh, <clears throat> let you know how much we love you. Everybody fill out one of these connect cards. If you're online, it's a little harder, but you can send us a text. Uh, but we want to pray for you this week. And so I use those things. If you have a request for a specific joy or concern to be lifted to the Lord by me, let's sit on the back. Uh, today we're talking about one more dream. 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 Dream a little dream with me. And so hopefully by the end of this communion time, uh, you will be uh, open to letting God shape your dreams. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be in your presence. We're so grateful to be able to, to gather in this place made sacred by the men and women, boys and girls who come before us. And now it's our turn to add our, our joys, our concerns, our, our thoughts, our prayers, our praise into this oh, chorus that's been going since this, this world was created, where all of creation shouts out to you, sees and responds to your glory, hears and just loves the sound of your voice. So, Father, help us a dream a little dream of you. In Jesus' name and all God's kids said, amen. 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 Join us in our call to worship, Psalm 71, uh, verses 1 through 6. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. In you, Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge, to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, and you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of those who are evil and cruel. For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth with my mom's womb. I will pray praise you. Continue to bring praise to the Lord. We're going to sing this is the day and then we'll morph that into I will enter his gates. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let me glad, I will rejoice for he has made 
Congregational prayer. Who's doing that? Tell me it's not me. Natalie. Natalie. Come on down. The prayer is right. Hi, everybody. Hi, Natalie. Father, thank you for your everlasting, overflowing, and merciful love. Fill our hearts anew with the wind of your spirit, that we might shine like lights in the darkness. Lead others to taste and believe in the grace and legacy of Jesus Christ, your precious Son. Amen. Amen. Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Natalie. We're going to sing this morning, Be Thou My Vision. And as you sing the words, you're going to notice that there are a lot of these, thous, and those in there. And some words that we don't usually use. So as I was uh, going over the song this week, I thought, well, this might, uh, I, I just thought, started to think about the words, and I thought, well, let me paraphrase this. So I'm going to read the words to you from the song that you're going to sing next, and, it, and I'm going to paraphrase it. Um, it's not going to rhyme, but I think it'll give a little bit of clarity to the meaning of it. Be my vision, be my focus be my dream lord of my heart nothing means more to me than you i think about you and those are the best thoughts of my day or my night and your presence is my light be my wisdom and be my truth I am always with you, and you are always with me, Lord. You're my great father, and I am your true daughter and son. You dwell in me, and, be, and I dwell in you, and that makes us one. Now, this is a verse that is, we're not going to sing this morning, but I just couldn't leave it out. I don't need riches. I don't need fame because you are my inheritance here, now, and in eternity. You and you alone are first in my heart, high king of heaven, my treasure you are. And the last verse is high king of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun, heart of my own heart, and whatever happens, still be my vision, still be my focus, still my, be my dream, O oh ruler of all. So if you'd stand and sing, now we're going to sing the words that are in the hymn book. Oh uh -huh. 
this morning, I guess you're all honorary Irish men and Irish women. Yes. So, and that's no blarney. Don't you love that song? Yeah. Could I get my slides up, please? Marilyn, may I get my slides up, please? Thank you. All right. You know, it's funny. God's got kind of a wicked sense of humor. He does. Hear me out. <clears throat> as soon as I get the oak pollen out of my throat. Oh. You know, one of the recurring dreams or nightmares I've had since I went into ministry was this. I would dream that I would show up to preach and not have anything to say. I would have forgotten my notes. And it never happened until this morning. We showed up right on time, and then the first service songs were hard, and I'm singing lead voice in the first service. And so I wanted to practice with the team so that we have a chance of communicating God's love in the first service. And then I left at about 25 till, went over to the office to grab my preaching Bible with my notes in it. And I opened it up, and guess what? No notes. No notes. And so I said, no problem, turned on the computer. When you're in a hurry, have you ever noticed it takes about an hour and a half for your computer to boot up? So it boots up finally, and I look in there, and the latest version of this, this was a hard message for me this week. It, was, it, it came out stillborn, stillborn twice, and I rejected both messages, the first two messages I wrote around one more dream. And then this is the final product. But uh, the only one I had on this computer here at the office was the first version which had nothing at all to do with the slides I'd already given to Marilyn. And it wasn't a very good sermon. I mean, it would have gotten an A or a B at seminary, but honestly, it just didn't communicate the heart of this. And so I ran to, ran to my car, took my Bible with me, because I knew I wouldn't have time to, to go home and get the sermon printed. You know, I had to turn on my computer at home. Guess how long it took to boot up? Yeah, yeah about an hour and a half. And uh, so I booted it up, printed it out, Stuffed it in my Bible and came running back here and got here about five minutes to nine. See, I now know how you guys drive when you park in the parking lot. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you find Jesus when you come into church. Okay. Um, so anyway, that was a nightmare for me. And it came true this morning. It was <coughs> Again, it's never happened before in 30 years of preaching. And it had to happen on the day that I was talking about dreams. So God is clearly in this. He was in it that I wrote two good messages, but they weren't the right messages. And then I wrote this message that I share with you today. Trish uh, Coburn's doctors told her that she was in perfectly good health. But that night when she went home, she had a dream and heard these words. Look deeper. So the next day, she returned to her doctor and told him about her dream. The doctor was skeptical, thinking she was a crackpot or something, and he agreed to do a colonoscopy, and they detected a cancer that was advanced enough it would have killed her. Our modern culture dismisses dreams. That's not true in the rest of the world, and it certainly wasn't true in the biblical world held in your Bible. Religious cultures, including Christianity, take dreams very seriously. The question this morning is, do you? You remember Joseph. Joseph was a prophetic dreamer called upon to explain the Pharaoh's dreams, you know, seven years of fat followed by seven years of lean. And because he listened to and interpreted that dream, millions of people, literally millions of people, were saved from starvation, including his father, brothers, and what would become the nation of Israel. Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream about a golden statue. John's revelation, the very last book in your Bible and mine, is a waking dream, a vision. It's about the end of the times, and it's coming. So dreams play an important role throughout the Bible. And I'm convinced that dreams need to play an important part in your life and mine. 
Dreams are simply thoughts, images, and sensations that play out in our mind during sleep or while you're awake. Yes, there are waking dreams. How many of you have ever said pleasant dreams to somebody? You know, that can be more than a wish. Lisa and I uh, will do this practice, and I commend it to you. Uh, we play a game before sleep reminiscent of the Song of Solomon's. Have you guys ever read that book in your Bible? Yeah, it's a waking dream. It's a vision. It's an idea of what a God-honoring, loving marriage should look like. So in our guided dreams, one of us, usually me, because I'm starting everything, that's just who I am, will begin our waking dream of vision like this. I'll say something like that, but just the other night, this is what it was. Say, honey, imagine we're on horses and we're riding in the surf at Corpus Christi, Padre Island, Texas. And then I'll shut up. Gentlemen, this is a cue for your own relationships. If you want to have a relationship, shut up long enough for her ideas to come out. Sometimes they come quickly and sometimes you just have to wait. How many of you are patient in waiting? But learn to wait, and some amazing things will happen. So then she continued the story, and then she got to a point where she paused, and I had been listening. There's another cue, gentlemen and women. Listen to what they're saying, because you're creating a vision, a shared reality. It's either going to be a nightmare, or it's going to be something you can treasure. So I added my part, and then her part, and my part, and her part, and then we both faded off to sleep. Guess what I dreamed about that night? I dreamed about horses, and more importantly, about being with my loving wife. What you put in your mind before you drift off to sleep will shape your dreams when you get to that REM sleep, that deep sleep, rapid eye movement. For those of you who think you don't dream, I'm not visiting you in an insane asylum, and the truth is, you will go insane if you don't dream. You see, it's in your dreams that you are healed. It's in your dreams that your hope can be restored. It's in your dreams where the realities of this world are temporarily set aside. How many of you have ever flown without the benefit of a plane in your dreams? It's amazing. And if you'd learn to ride a motorcycle, you could experience it in this life, okay? <laughs> They're important. Dreams are when you set down all of the constraints and rules of, re of your reality. You can be who you want to be. You can relive who you once were. That's the power of dreams. And here's what I want to slip into your understanding on dreams. It's in that unguarded or free or childlike state that God can speak to you. God speaks to you through the Bible, but unless you disengage your adult and re-engage your child, and you're going to hear what you've heard before. You can hear it as a story of what to do or what not to do. You can hear it as a guideline instead of letting God speak his truth into your life. So we know that dreams are thoughts and images and even sensations that play out on the screen of our mind during sleep or while you're awake. Read with me Joel 2.28. God promised, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Are you part of all people? Yes. That's exactly right. So whether you realize it or not, God is pouring out his dreams upon you. When you're busy fighting traffic or fighting one another or worried about finances or health, the odds are you cannot feel God's dream. He goes on and says, your sons and daughter will what? Prophesy. What does it mean to prophesy? It can mean to predict the future. It can also mean to explain the present or even the past. To prophesy in a biblical sense means that you're simply listening to God and speaking God's truth into this world. 
And oftentimes you speak God's truth into this world in the face of lies or misunderstanding. So God is trying to pour out his spirit, his understanding, his heart upon all people. But especially upon his people. The sons and daughters. You become a son or a daughter of God when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And when you do that, then you should be able to hear with growing clarity what God is saying to you. And so you will begin to speak truth in a world that is no longer used to hearing God's truth. And then it says your old men will do what? I want to turn this diamond just a little bit so that you see this facet. If you've been in Christ for a while and you've seen God's grace, experienced God's mercy, mercy, and understand more and more of God's truth found in God's word, confirmed by God's spirit, then you need to dream dreams. And it's not talking about lying in the bed in your nursing home remembering when you could run you know, a four-minute mile. It's not about that. It's to speak God's truth, God's dream, into this world today. So you dream God's dream. What would it be like for my children and grandchildren to truly know the Lord? What would it be like for the kids at my, the schools in my town to hear how much God loves them? To have a message that counters the message about it's all about you, it's all about your pleasure, it's all about not getting caught. What would it be like to dream God's dreams and share them with the generations? Next week we're going to do a message, one more generation, as we really kick off our capital campaign. Oh, we need a roof. We need several things, but what we really need is to go ahead and step up to the truth of this verse. To dream God's dreams, to speak God's truth in the world that is running, not just walking away from it. And to build a place where people can be healed and restored and renewed. To build a place where marriages can become rock solid in Jesus Christ. To build a place or no matter what you've done, or how small or insignificant you feel, you will discover your infinite worth in Jesus Christ. So your old men and women, we, in the faithful generations, must speak God's truth to those who have not heard it or embraced it. And then, and then, the young men, the young generations, will see God's dream for them see vision. This is a truth that we must embrace. God's word says that if we do not lift up Christ, the very rocks will shout God's glory. But we will have missed the ride. Dreams and visions are two ways God speaks to his children. In scripture, God uses dreams and vision to free the downtrodden, to provide warning and encouragement to his children, to turn hearts back to him. Of course, not every dream or vision is from the Lord. The Bible warns us that Satan uses dreams and visions to sow seeds of doubt and discouragement and ungodly direction in unsuspecting believers. 1 John or one. Read it with me, would you? Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into this world. There are people, there are programs, there are organizations that speak lies that have been embraced by generations. And so they sow pain, they sow discouragement, and even though it seems like a way out of a predicament, the truth is it's a way down into the depths of despair. And so you, instead of pushing through a problem with the Holy Spirit, you abandon the truth of life with a lie of death. And you need to break free. 
from that spiral. You need to be able to forgive yourself. You need to be able to forgive them. You need to be able to dream again. Do not believe every spirit, but what? Test the spirits to see where they come from. Because many false prophets have gone forth and they are speaking lies and teaching them. So how do we test the spirits? Three things, simple enough, but it always works. If a dream or a vision does not, or tries to convince you of something contrary to the word of God, it is not from the Lord. And I don't care who tells you it is. It could be a pastor, it could be a well-known teacher, somebody with an iPod, or, or a podcast, I should say, or somebody on TV or whatever, with a huge following. But if it does not square with God's word, it's out of plumb. It is not the truth. So read Proverbs 29, 18 with me, would you? Where there is no revelation. The Bible is God's revelation. Where there is no revelation, where people don't read the Bible, where people don't know the Bible, where people have not become workmen approved, knowing how to handle God's word. And there is no revelation. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And this world has fallen for a lot of lies. So where there is no revelation, the people are what? They cast off restraint. And you don't even know many times that you have walked away from the path that leads to life. You don't know that that habit you've developed of gossiping or, or I don't know, you pick it up. It's truly a, the highway to hell. Where there is no revelation, where you don't know God's word, where you don't seek to understand it and apply God's word into your life, into your marriage, into your business, into your relationships with everybody in this world, then you will cast off restraint. The Bible tells us there is a way that seems right unto man, but its way leads unto death. But this is, many Proverbs are a couplet. They say something and then they say the opposite to make sure you get the point. So read the second part of that couplet. But happy is he who keeps the law. Know the law, keep the law. And you'll be what? So if you don't know the law, and you don't keep the law, what does that mean? You're That's right, you're going to be miserable. You're going to be unhappy. So how do you test the spirits? First of all, what does the Bible say? You can trust what the Bible says. The second thing is, pray about it. Pray about it. If a dream or a vision supposedly comes from the Lord, then isn't he the best person to confirm it? Jesus, did you really say to me? Did you really mean this for me? Ephesians 3.16, read it for me, would you? I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources. Stop right there. What do you know about the future? What does God know about the future? From his glorious unlimited resources. God knows the way that leads to life. And God knows every detour that leads to death. So from his glorious unlimited resources. The Lord will do what? Empower you. Enable you to make the right choice. Enable you to forgive yourself. To forgive others. And rise again. And that comes from an inner strength through what? His spirit. Some of you say, I don't have that inner strength in me. Then I'll share this with you. The Bible assures us that if you pray the sinner's prayer, <coughs> excuse me, if you simply say, Lord, I've tried it my way and it didn't work out the way I thought it would. And so I trust that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah sent to do for me what I couldn't do, not just remove the weight of my sin, but to remove the appetite for me, the bent towards sinning. And with the best I can, with all that I know and all that I don't know, I simply trust that Jesus is my Lord. He gets the right to tell me what to do and what not to do. And he's my Savior. So not only save me for eternal life, but save me into the abundant life now. So if you've prayed a prayer something like that at some point in your time, the Bible tells us you have received the Holy Spirit. 
you may need to say, hi, my name is Jerry, who are you? Well, I'm the Holy Spirit. I've been living here for a long time trying to get a word in edgewise. But he won't be impatient and he won't be angry. He won't be upset. He'll smile ear to ear and God's ears are pretty far apart. <laughs> so it's the biggest smile you'll ever see. He'll say, we need to talk. And in that conversation, you will receive healing. You'll discover wholeness. You'll discover a joy that the world cannot take away no matter what else it's taken. So how do you test the spirits? God's word. And then ask Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will tell you whether it's a way to go or a way to avoid. And the third one is this. Whatever it is, whatever that dream is, whatever that desire is, whatever that vision is, of uh, my life would be better if. Irma Bombeck said, the grass is always greener over what? Yeah, the septic tank. But we always, say, we always say the other side of the fence, but it's over the septic tank. Why? Because it has stuff in it that we call fertilizer. Okay? Here's the deal. Those people saying they're doing all this and they look like all that on the Facebook pages, you're saying 1% of who they are, the best 1%. And as far as you knew, that trophy couple has a miserable life together. As far as you know, the one that's got 7,000 Facebook friends is the loneliest person you know. You need to have friends. We talked about that last week. And this is one of the primary reasons. When the world is going to try to get you to walk in a path that leads to death, when the world is going to try to make, get you to make a decision that will bring death into your life, mentally, physically, emotionally, financially, you need to have somebody that you can get, go to. Read it with me, would you, Proverbs 15, 22? Without consultation and wise advice. Trust me, you can get all kinds of foolish advice. You don't need it. I don't care if they're your parents, your best friend, your pastor. How does it line up against God's word? How does it feel in your spirit? Do you get a spirit check? You need to have people who are mature in the Christian faith. Not wise in the eyes of the world, but people who know what the Bible says. People who have that close presence, the Holy Spirit, that you long for. Without talking to them, consultation, without them having the wisdom that God wants to give you, you're in trouble. And whatever it is, that want, need, or desire that you think will be made uh, available to you through this course of action, this dream, it will lead to frustration. Read the rest with me, would you? But with... Many counselors, they are established and succeeded. I go to my friend and I say, John, I've had this dream three nights in a row. And in this dream, I, you know, if you dream a dream long enough, you begin to think that it's from the Lord. You begin to think that the, the benefits outweigh the costs. And if you don't consult with wise, Christian, mature Christian people, you'll convince yourself to do some really stupid, some really unwise things. But when you consult with the right people, you'll say, you know, I think that was a bad burrito that gave me that dream. <laughs> I'd rather eat a bad burrito in my dream than in the real world. How about you? So, children, do you think children dream and are happier than adults? No. I do. I absolutely do. Unless they're in an abusive environment. They're in an abusive environment where they you can't think that, you can't feel that way, you should shut up. I want to make sure you're seen but not heard. Some of you are raised in that environment. That wasn't God's idea. That wasn't God's dream for you. Children can dream. Children can play. Children can laugh. There is a child that lives in each of us. Even if you've tried to tell that child to shut up and sit down. Children are happier because their hearts and minds are filled with wonder. They're filled with hope. And that leads to creativity. A child can put two completely competing ideas together and it works in their imagination. Can you do that? 
As a child plays, they pretend they're Batman or Spider-Man or a Disney princess. Do you still play? Is your imagination dead? Or is it alive? I ask a very serious question with very serious consequences. Because if you can't play, you aren't really dreaming. Which means you are closed off to dreaming God's dreams, to playing with the Holy Spirit. Not my idea. It comes from the Jewish carpenter that I served. Read it with me, would you? Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In another place, the same Jesus says it's not just entering the kingdom of heaven, die and go to the, you know, your pie in the sky. You won't even see the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is here right now. It surrounds us right now. But you may have such a rigid, disciplined worldview that you can't see the goodness of God. You can't accept or offer the grace of God. You won't believe that the mercy of God is real. And so you can't offer mercy to others. A really smart guy named Henry David Thoreau said this, just listen. Let go of the past and go for the future. Go confidently in the direction of your dreams. Live the life you imagine. Oh, Jerry, I was a child. You need to become a child again. The happiest adults operate out of their imagination and their dreams, not their histories. Not the histories that were good. If the last time you were happy is when you made that touchdown in high school, it's overdue. You need to be happy. The last time you were happy is before you did that bad thing. You're overdue. You need to let go of that and receive forgiveness. The last time you were happy is before somebody told you or you decided you were ugly in whatever aspect that you can't stand about yourself, you need to hear the voice of God. Saying, come on, let's go play. Jesus says that we may be must become like little children. What if God wants to play with you? You know, life's biggest problems, happiness, purpose, meaning, are worked out in dreams. A moral compass, the Bible, oh, helps. But you need a playmate, the Holy Spirit. We need to connect our spirit to God's spirit, and we do that through what? Guess what? Dreams. So what keeps us from dreaming, from imagining, and then building a better future, a future that God is calling us into, but we don't think we deserve, or we don't think we can attain because of? Our past, our past that's weighing down our heart and limiting our ability to enjoy the present moment and step into a better future. I want you to think of your past for a minute as a suitcase like this. But instead of holding clothes, this suitcase holds bricks. It holds bricks like fear. It didn't start out as a brick, it started out as a stone. Maybe you were playing with a bumblebee and you got stung. And so now you're deathly afraid of bumblebees. You don't need it, but you carry 10 EpiPens anyway. Maybe it's shame. Maybe it started out with that moment when you felt your face flush and your imagination ran wild. Everybody's talking about me. I didn't do or I did do something that was embarrassing. And instead of just owning it, naming it for what it, was, what it was and letting it go, you've kept that. And then something else similar happens and so the stone became a rock. And then something else happens and that rock becomes a brick and something else happens and that brick becomes a boulder and you carry it in the suitcase of your history, your life. Regrets the same way. Anger is the biggest rock that most of us carry. 
when the world didn't treat you the way you expected to be treated, when the, you didn't get what you felt you deserved. And so simply just accepting it is what it is, you make it become something that justifies adding to the weight of your suitcase. And so instead of just being somebody who is angry, you become an angry person. And you look for, without knowing it, you look for proof that your anger is justified. And you've carried that weight for so long, you're not sure who you'd be without your regret, your anger, your shame, your fear. There's a sense of security in it. Because it's full of familiarity. Hear this truth. You cannot experience your best life if you live out of your suitcase. The book of Jeremiah was written when God's people were acting childish, not childlike. They were ignoring God's commands. They were worshiping other gods. They even sacrificed their children, as America has, for over 50 years. And here's the truth. God cannot protect sin. The only thing God can do for sin in your life, my life, and every life is to listen for your confession and as soon as those words are in your mind before they're on your lips, the word of God assures us that if we confess, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from that thought, from that feeling, from the effect of that action. God cannot and will not protect your sin. So while you willfully live your life outside of God's commands, you are outside of God's blessing. In the first 28 chapters of the book of Jeremiah, Israel is living outside of God's blessing. Without God's covering, Babylon easily conquers them, just as the world will easily conquer you, believer, if you don't live as if Jesus is your Lord and Savior. So they lost everything. They lost their homes, their families, their way of life. They even lost their beloved Jerusalem. Jeremiah is called the wailing prophet for a very good reason. And if you take an honest look at the weight in your life, the weight in your suitcase, you can be a wailing prophet too. But God doesn't want you to wail. God wants you to heal. Then suddenly we get to chapter 29, verse 11, and Jeremiah writes to the exiles who've been deported to Babylon. He's writing to them there, but he's writing to us here. And in Jeremiah 29, 11, we find hope. Read it with me, would you? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope. So I want you to think of dreaming as a gift from God. Where God can meet you in the sandbox of your life. A place where you can be whimsical. A place where you can build things that could never exist in the real world. But a place where you can discover the depths of your sin and the heights of forgiveness. Think of dreaming as a gift from God. Or you glimpse where God wants to lead you no matter where you are or where you've been. You may have lost your spouse or your house. You may have lost your job or your health, your self-respect. But God is not done with you yet. This is your verse, 2911. Know it, memorize it, pull it out when the nightmare comes back. Pull it out when the choice to live a left hand life or to take away something you have no right to take away from somebody else. When that desire comes, pull it out and say, God is not done with me yet. Turn to your neighbor and say that, God is not done with you yet. Would you do that? <laughs> God's plan is to give you a future and a hope, you really. This is not some esoteric talk on Christianity. A woman in a hospice house shared a dream that she had before she died. 
And in her dream, she saw a candle flickering on the windowsill of her hospice room. Suddenly, the flame went out, leaving the dreamer in total darkness and very afraid. A few moments later, the candle reappeared on the other side of the window. And the light from that candle lit up her room from the outside. A few days after she shared that dream, she did die. She needed one more dream to know that God knew, that God hadn't forgotten her, that he had a plan, a future filled with hope. Friends, you need one more dream. A God-given vision of the future is filled with the hope that God has for you on the other side of whatever it is you're facing. Dare to dream again. Now go out and play with God. Amen? Amen. We're going to share communion. One of the great joys in communion is always that I ask you Take whatever it is that the world has given you, dumped into your life, and give it to God. To restore that which is in you that the world has taken away. And to trust that God is not shaming you, that God is not asking you to bear the weight of your regret. That God wants to take away your anger and remind you that you are his beloved child, whom his son, Jesus Christ, died for. That's just how much you're worth. So join me in this invitation to Holy Communion. You don't have to be a member here. You don't have to be Methodist. Many people have found salvation in the truth of a communion message like this and in the truth that when I ask the Holy Spirit to change ordinary bread and ordinary grape juice into the blood and the body of Jesus Christ, that really takes place. That there is a power in the blood can overcome anything in this world. So let's enter into that communion. Christ our Lord invites to this his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of your sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us join this prayer together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. I would ask those who are going to help me serve communion this morning to come forward and uh, cleanse your hands with that, that uh, stuff there on the altar rail. <laughs> Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for this hurting world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory be yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. On the night in which Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room, he took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The truth is, many of us think that we must clean up our act before we come to God. That somehow we got to stop using those words or thinking those thoughts or feeling those feelings. That we have to be worthy. You've been taught by some churches, and the Bible does say, do not take, eat or drink in an unworthy fashion. What that really means is this. There has never been a person who came to the communion table that was not a sinner, never except Jesus Christ. 
It's his righteousness that we receive. To eat or drink in an unworthy fashion is to treat it as if it's just a snack. To treat it as if it's just a ritual that we're supposed to do. If you understand even half of what I shared with you this morning, then you are worthy. You know that God loves you. That God wants to heal you from your past. That God wants you to dream his dreams once again. If that's where you are today, this is your moment. Take and eat. This is his body broken for you. And then after the supper, he took the cup and again he offered thanks and he said, drink from this, all of you. No one is worthy. No one is capable of doing what this cup offers on your own. Whatever challenge, whatever sin, whatever appetite, whatever addiction you face, whether it's substance abuse, whether it's gossip, whether it's just this pride that won't let you bow your heart before the God of creation when it's obvious that all of this must have happened by an intelligent, knowing, and loving force. But for whatever reason you bought into the lies, it says it's just a primordial soup. Where did the soup come from? Campbell's didn't exist. You need to bring all of that. Everything that is holding you back from laughing with God's Holy Spirit, from taking your hurts and pains and being like two five-year-olds on the playground. One hurts the other. I hate you. And then five minutes later, they're playing again. They're best friends. That's what it means to see and to live into the kingdom of God, to live without the weight of your past and to take the bricks that you've put in other people's suitcases, take them out and shatter them with grace and mercy. That's what Christ meant when he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, a covenant of love sealed in forgiveness, made possible because he is God in the flesh. And he knew how desperately he needed because he truly was one of us. So take and drink and leave your pain at the altar. Leave your shame. Leave your guilt. Leave your anger. Leave your addiction. And walk away dreaming again. All right. Who's doing the front? Is this the front? You're doing the front? Okay. There you go. And then I'll get yours here in a minute. I used to be able to do it in a few seconds, but I can't run that fast anymore. All right. So, again, let the uh, server give you the bread, and then you can take the cup. Okay. So as the servers get st go on the station... Uh, please uh, come with a broken heart, with a confused mind. Come with a spotty past. But let Christ lift you out of the rubble of your life and dream. Let's commune together.
everybody get served that wanted to be served? I've got two pieces of bread left. I also have the show bread, which is uh, an Irish soda bread. Anybody want seconds? I could get the team to come on up for our closing hymn, Seek Ye First. I didn't get a chance to say it to you at the altar rail. You are a beloved child of God. You are forgiven. It's time. Time to dream. Dream again. Amen? Amen. Amen. Be seated for just a minute. And, you know, we used to do announcements at the beginning of worship, but the truth is, after 60 minutes, you didn't remember anything. <laughs> So these are next steps, things that you can and probably should do this week. Uh, immediately following this, march down the hall, join your friends uh, who are down there enjoying our strawberry festival. So there's strawberry uh, shortcakes, there's strawberry shakes, there's all kinds of yummy stuff. Lisa made some strawberry bars, and I know other ladies baked as well. So go ahead and enjoy some of Plant City's finest. And then uh, we have an Easter family celebration we had our planning meeting yesterday. Uh, it's going to be on Saturday, March 30th. Mark your calendar. Uh, come and enjoy it. It's going to be far more than Easter egg hunt this year. Uh, we're going to need a lot of volunteers to come and empower this witness to our community. And then uh, uh, we have, I'm putting together a team uh, from the church. For those who can still walk, I can do mostly. Lisa and I are going to walk together, so we're not going to run a race. Uh, but it's for the... Uh, the uh, um, Karen, 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 yeah, and uh, which is close to my heart. And uh, we want to, you know, let me just be honest. I'm a very competitive guy. There's a young pastor named Seth in the community. I think he's in Felsmere, and he and the <coughs> Community Baptist Church always win uh, the competition. You know, the pastor and the church that have raised the most money for this worthy cause, they win. And I want to win this year. <laughs> so even if you say you can't walk if you're not available that Saturday uh, then fine uh, but make sure you sponsor somebody uh, make sure you sponsor two or three somebody's and uh, we want we want to raise money for this cause we really do it'll be a great win if you walk you need to sign up out in the, the cafe and give us your t-shirt size don't lie if you order a small you're going to get a small okay <laughs> 
So uh, join me in that. And then uh, um, I think that's it really for this week. Did I forget anything, Lisa? Strawberry Festival 12 to 3. That's Come it. join us. Strawberry <laughs> Festival 12 to 3. That's where I'm going. That's now. It is. <laughs> We're so serious at this church, man. I love it. All right, would you please rise to receive this blessing? There's a great book that's been out probably 20 years now called The Shack. And it has a very interesting image of God in it. God the Father is this huge black woman. I just love that image because when I was five and years old, first grade in Albuquerque, my mom and dad both worked, and I was raised by this huge black woman. And, uh, you know, when she hugged you, you were hugged all over. <laughs> so that image fits well for me. I had some friends that were kind of rigid Christian people, and they uh, thought it was offensive. It wasn't offensive to me at all. God is this huge, warm, loving presence that wants to enfold you. But of the Trinity, the one I liked the most was the Holy Spirit. And she was just remarkable. She was whimsical. She was fun. She wanted to play. She wanted to heal. She wanted to restore. She was a great gardener. God wants to do that in your life. If you were raised with a rigid view of God, a view of Christianity says, you're a Christian if you don't do this and do that, then I want you to at least entertain this possibility that I raised this morning. What if God really wants to play with you? and heal you, and restore you, and take away those appetites, that bent to sinning. I think it's true. Go forth in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to eat strawberries and to drink. Amen. <laughs> See you Wednesday.